students so today the guest speaker is uh, dr sheela ramamurthy and uh, she is a veterinarian who obtained her uh, bvsc from madras veterinary college in india ms in microbiology and molecular genetics from oklahoma state university followed by phd in biomedical sciences from uh, virginia tech she has served in several academic position and is currently an associate professor at north dakota state university <laughs> The research is focused on studying vaccine-mediated immunity and developing novel vaccines and diagnostics in the context of polymicrobial respiratory disease complex of uh, swine. She has authored over 50 peer-reviewed publications in uh, reputable journals in the field of uh, in the field and holds patent for novel vaccine development uh, approaches. The research program is well funded by. Federal agencies like NIH, USDA, as well as regional funding agency. She also serves as the chair of NC229 National Committee on, uh, uh, if I am correct, is post in respiratory uh, swine uh, virus, I guess, and emerging infections of swine. <laughs> uh, she is also editor of Archives of Virology, a board member of American Association of Veterinary Immunology, and in several diversity and equity related. Initiatives of for your uh, university, and uh, she is not new to this uh, IDP program because uh, during the year 2019 uh, she came to India and she conducted a training program on molecular microbiological methods for the benefit of uh, third year BBS and DH students at Namakal uh, College, which is well received by the students as per their uh, feedback. And uh, she is an alumni of Madras Veterinary College, so she knows even out of this uh, out, out of Tanavas. So now, I request Sheila Ramamurthy to deliver the lecture. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And it is true, um, I had some really good times in Madras Veterinary College. I wish I can go back, but unfortunately that doesn't happen. But I'm truly glad to join all of you here today. Uh, you know, I wish I could have been there in person, but Zoom is not bad at all as a second option. So I thought we today can have, you know, a discussion and a lecture about next generation vaccines, because right now this is something that's a hot topic in the field and there are a lot of controversies and people are concerned about okay. whether they should get vaccinated or should they not get vaccinated. and you know, what would happen if they had side effects and so on and so forth. Um, so this is why I chose this topic. Just a second. Yeah. So I, we all know the story of Edward Jenner, who in 1976 discovered the first vaccine against smallpox. Uh, he basically used cowpox from milkmaid's hands and he vaccinated this small boy called uh, Phipps. And what he did was what is what we now call scarification. He just basically took infective material and he passed on this infective material to the host, which is this boy. And they found that when he did this, the exposed people were completely resistant to smallpox. And this was the beginning of vaccination. Um, as we know it right now. And uh, I'm not very sure if you have already taken immunology or virology. So forgive me if I sound condescending and if I'm telling you things that you already know. Um, and by the same token, if it's too complicated, again, when you get to the point where you're taking immunology, you will um, hopefully appreciate what I'm saying better. Uh, it's just that it's been so many years that right now I'm not sure what second year BDSC students are taking. So by definition, a vaccine is a weakened form of disease. It's the weakened form of, they call it germs, it can be a virus, it can be bacteria. And once this is injected into the body, the host makes a response to the antigen, which can be an antibody response or it can be a cell-mediated immune response. And then once the host encounters the pathogen again, they will be protected against second exposure. So this is the principle by which vaccines work. As we know, 
Uh, it's a very simplified version of uh, the concept. But then we know that this is probably one of the greatest discoveries that was ever made that can impact animal health and uh, public health for human beings. But the situation when Edward Jenner discovered vaccines is very similar to what we are going through right now. There were a lot of uh, myths that were propagated, false information, and they also thought, you know, that he was trying to uh, maybe kill off the population. And so this was the kind of publicity that he happened to get until everybody was really saved and they, you know, were not experiencing smallpox again. And that is when he started being celebrated as a scientist. And uh, same thing like when uh, cholera was a big problem in those days. And if you can see here, this is one of the notices that was posted by the government. And what they said was people who had cholera have to be temperate in eating and drinking. Um, they said don't drink cold water and then uh, refrain from ardent spirits, which I think they mean alcohol. And if you're addicted, they said you can drink a little bit, but not much. So you can see how there is a lot of, um, you know, it's the same thing like the messages that we get on WhatsApp, where they say, you know, if you have COVID, maybe drink lime water. I'm just making this up, but you do see a lot of false information out there. And as students of science, I think it's important to have a critical, um, I think critical thinking in processing this information and in being able to tease out what is real and what is not real, right? I mean, uh, it's something that I think as public servants that it's critical for us to do. So how do vaccines actually act in the body? So the first step is the antigen is exposed. I mean, the host gets exposed to the antigen through the vaccination. And these antigens are taken up by antigen presenting cells, which are usually dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells can also act as antigen presenting cells. And the antigen presenting cells then interact with actually CD4 positive T cells. I'm not sure why this uh, picture doesn't, it should link here to the CD4 positive T cells, which are called helper T cells. And these cells, when they are activated, can go in and stimulate the antibody response. They can act on B cells and make B cells proliferate and then produce antibodies. Or they can act on T cells and stimulate a cytotoxic T cell response. So that way, any virus that is intracellular, intracellular bacteria will get cleared off by the cytotoxic T cells while uh, antibodies can attach to extracellular antigens and they can clear, uh, you know, when the virus is outside the system or bacteria. And uh, basically I work with viruses, so I tend to use viruses as examples, but the same thing would work for bacteria as well. So then we have this important concept of herd immunity, which Dr. John Kripakaran just mentioned. So, um, I think when the COVID pandemic was happening, again, there was a misconception about what herd immunity is exactly, which is why I had this slide in here. You probably might have already heard about this concept. So when you have a population of naive individuals who are probably healthy, but who have not been previously exposed to a certain pathogen, once the pathogen sets in this population and starts producing disease here, the ones in red are the ones who are exposed. It then is able to spread rampantly through the population because this naive population has no previous exposure. They have no immunity whatsoever. And this is exactly what is happening in pandemic situations or in animal diseases when we have outbreaks and there is no protection whatsoever, right? But then when we have a vaccine and the majority of the people are vaccinated, here, the people in yellow are all vaccinated. And then you might have a few individuals, the ones in blue, who are healthy but not vaccinated. And then you may have a few other individuals who then become sick. So in this case, the sick individuals are not able to spread the disease because the majority of the population is vaccinated and transmission to these 
blue people here who are healthy but not vaccinated, it doesn't happen. And in that way, the disease is basically curtailed. There might be a little bit of spread if the vaccination rates are low, but by and large, the entire population remains protected. Right, and when COVID first broke out, you might remember that there were reports of some countries, I believe Sweden, possibly the UK, where they said that they are going to acquire herd immunity but by letting the disease run through the population. So this is not what herd immunity is about. It's not about letting, uh, you know, a virulent virus run through the entire population and then face, uh, you know, enormous amounts of mortality and burdens on the healthcare. Rather, it is using a vaccination and prevention approach to make sure that the population is protected against a certain disease. So then what are next generation vaccines? So when we started with, or rather from Edward Jenner's time, so the first vaccine that he made, it was basically a hetero septic vaccine. I mean, it was not a vaccine that um, was either attenuated or inactivated because at that point in time, they didn't even know what was causing this, right? But once microbiology started developing as a field and they were able to isolate pathogens, they were able to culture pathogens, that was the point they started making conventional vaccines. And to tell you the truth, until today, the maximum, I mean, the most commercial vaccines are still conventional vaccines. They are either inactivated vaccines or attenuated vaccines. So I'll go into what that is in the next slide. But uh, it was not until maybe the late 80s, mid 80s, that is when we started seeing what we call next generation vaccines. And there are many different definitions, but to me, a next generation vaccine is one where recombinant DNA technology is involved, where you can take a gene, clone that gene, and then produce a protein from there. And this, all depends on the central dogma of molecular biology, which is nothing but the concept that we all have DNA as our genetic material. Some viruses have DNA, then others have RNA. That's a different uh, issue. But from DNA, we end up getting RNA, mostly mRNA or uh, you know your uh, the RNA that can code for proteins. And then this process is called transcription. And from RNA, we end up getting proteins by the process of translation, right? So this is the center, central dogma of molecular biology. So next generation vaccines are any type of vaccine that can either contain DNA, they can contain RNA, or all vaccines contain protein. But conventional vaccines have the proteins in their native form from directly from the microbe. In the case of next generation vaccines, they are produced by means of cloning, where a gene of interest is cut and copied, pasted into a vector, and from that vector, we are able to produce proteins. So, like I was saying, we have the classical platforms, inactivated vaccines, and then we have attenuated vaccines. Um, the main advantages of inactivated vaccines are they are very safe, so we can use you can use them, you know, across a spectrum of, for example, pregnant women, immunocompromised people. So safety is a very good uh, feature of this type of vaccine. The disadvantage is um, it makes a strong antibody responses, not so much cell-mediated immunity. And for some reason for viral diseases, they are not as effective as attenuated vaccines. So in the case of attenuated vaccines, the virus is somehow converted into a weakened form, mostly by serially passaging it, passaging it either in cells or in a host to which it's not specific. And then this vaccine, when it goes into the system, will resemble natural infection in the way that antigen presentation happens, but it doesn't produce the disease. So it ends up being more effective. And sometimes they also stay within the system for a really long time. So there is no need for a booster and there is no need for multiple vaccinations like we would in the case of inactivated vaccines. And then with next generation vaccines, the most popular ones are subunit vaccines, where a single gene is usually identified as being protective. 
So for the case of SARS coronavirus, we know that it's the spike protein. You must have seen that over and over. So most of the subunit vaccines for COVID-19 contain the spike protein. So here in this picture, it's this yellow structure that is on the top of the virus, which is the one immunogenic structure, right? So for subunit vaccines, it would work really well if you know exactly which protein is protective for that virus. But by and large, we are not all that lucky. You know, not all viruses are like SARS-CoV-2 because they will have multiple proteins. Multiple proteins can be protective. And to make a good subunit vaccine, we may have to throw in a lot of different proteins into the mix. And then we have <clears throat> virus-like particle vaccines where it's just the genetic material alone is removed. And we have all of the other structures to make it into a, what is called an empty viral capsid, but it resembles the structure of a complete virus. So in this way, attachment to cells, entry into cells, and then antigen presentation, all of this will resemble uh, you know, a natural viral infection and we expect to get better protection with the virus-like particle vaccine. And of course, because there is no genetic material, there is no replication and so it's extremely safe. And then we have the viral vector vaccines, and this is the one that is uh, Covishield, you know, for um, COVID-19. And this is usually uh, where we pick the protective antigen that we are interested in, and it's shuttled into another virus or another bacteria, usually which is non non-pathogenic to the host. And then this, recombinant virus or bacteria is administered to the host and it goes into the host system and starts producing the protein of interest. So in this way, the host is immunized and generally they don't get a reaction against the vector, the, the, you know, the virus or the bacteria that's carrying the host. But then there are many disadvantages like Dr. Kripakaran mentioned. For example, we all have antibodies to adenoviruses so if we are using, you know, the adenovirus as a vector to deliver the antigen, it can get wiped out of the system very quickly. So we may or may not get the protective response that we want. And of course, now there are a lot of stories about blood clots um, and, you know, the vaccines were withdrawn for a period of time. Exports have stopped. So is all this real, um, you know, is this really a problem or not? And that is something that I, uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, in my subsequent uh, slides. So then we also have DNA vaccines where you can directly deliver DNA to the host uh, in the form of a plasmid. So the plasmid has a promoter that will work for a mammalian system if we are vaccinating the mammalian uh, population. And then there's the gene of interest. Here it's in yellow. It's just shuttled into this plasmid that can help to produce the protein. And this whole plasmid is delivered to the host as a vaccine. So once it's in the system, it's going to go in there, produce the protein, and then produce the antibody response as desired. This is the ideal situation, but there are a lot of problems with DNA vaccines. I'll talk about them later. So then uh, we have RNA vaccines, which now with this pandemic have become very popular. It's actually a very um, novel and innovative, very neat kind of technology, where if you remember the central dogma, you went from DNA to RNA to protein, right? So we have the DNA vaccines up here. So similar to DNA, we can also use RNA directly as a vaccine. So this concept has, it came after DNA vaccines, it has been around for a while, but this is the first time it has been deployed at this, level, you know, in this mass um, vaccination program as a nucleic acid vaccine. And then we have antigen presenting cells, which can be used as vaccines. So this again is something that's novel and mostly it's used for cancer therapy because it can be customized to specific individuals where you can just take out the immune cells, program them in such a way that they are going to go in and attack the specific site that you are interested in 
controlling. For example, if somebody has melanomas, uh, these T cells can be programmed in such a way that they have a receptor to that specific melanoma protein. So they will go and attach to that protein and specifically target cancer in that, uh, in that location without causing destruction elsewhere. Again, it's very novel technology, but it's just picking up at this point in time. So, um, one of the first, um, I think, the myth that everybody, um, at least in the human world, is worried about is that vaccines can cause very severe side effects, right? People are worried about taking vaccines. And at least I know that my family in India, when even when vaccines were first available, um, they apparently were told by the doctors to wait for two or three months before they went in and took those shots. So even within the medical community, there I think uh, it was the same here in the US. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of concern about what vaccines can do within the system. Um, unfortunately, I would say vaccines have kind of been victims of their own success because uh, probably people in your generation, you don't even remember or uh, you may not have experienced diseases like measles, chickenpox, which, uh, you know, people in the older generations, all of us have had those diseases. And now, you know, they are creeping back because people are hesitating to vaccinate. And uh, this is kind of unfortunate because I would say vaccines are one of the most successful tools that we have had, both for public health as well as for, um, you know, for animal diseases and being able to prevent them, in being able to prevent economic uh, losses due to production animal infectious diseases. But, um, you know, we still are like dealing with this problem of vaccine hesitancy. And one of the reasons is people believe that they can cause very severe side effects. And with the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson adenoviral vector vaccines, one of the major problems that um, it's perceived to, I mean, one of the problems with hesitancy at this point is that it's perceived to ca cause, um, but I'm sorry, it's perceived to cause blood clots and sudden death, uh, especially in younger populations. So what causes this actually? I mean, is there a scientific basis? Can this actually happen? So when we are um, manufacturing vaccines, there are a number of ingredients that go into preparing the vaccine, right? So the most important thing is that active ingredient, which is the protein, or in this case, the RNA or DNA. And then there can be adjuvants that are added and adjuvants are nothing but substances that can actually improve the body's immune response to the antigen. And then sometimes there will be preservatives. This is to prevent contamination with extraneous organisms because um, vaccines are made in cell cultures. Usually they will contain proteins that can support the growth of bacteria. And we definitely don't want any, any other pathogen within that system. For example, if the vaccine is for COVID-19, we don't want E. coli to be present in that preparation because then we don't know what's going to happen to the person who's vaccinated because of the E. coli, right? Um, to give you an example. And thiomersol is one preservative that has been used for a long time. It was used for a long time. Right now, it's only being used in influenza multiple dose vaccines. And this was removed for the same reason, because there was public perception that it can cause autism, and which was proven to be untrue many, many times. But still to, uh, you know, to counter public perception, thiamersol has been removed from vaccine preparations. And then we have stabilizers, which help to maintain the structure of the protein over the shelf life, like sorbitol or gelatin. Um, and then we do have antibiotics, residual antibiotics in vaccines because we use antibiotics uh, when we culture viruses in the lab or during vaccine manufacture. And then you can have agents that are used for inactivation of the virus. For example, formaldehyde is a common inactivant. And as we know, at high doses, formaldehyde can be 
cancerous, I mean, it can cause carcinogenesis. And uh, of course, if the vaccine is made in eggs, we might end up having egg protein in the mix. So then um, what happens when all of this goes into our body, right? That is a legitimate concern. So uh, we know like as students of toxicology, a lot of whether, uh, you know, somebody's, uh, I forget what that is, where somebody's medicine is somebody else's poison. Uh, so it all depends on the dose, right? It's the dose that makes the poison. In itself, there are a lot of things that we consume where if we consume them in, you know, without a limit, it is going to end up as a toxin in our body. So let's take thiomersol, for example. So thiomersol actually contains ethyl mercury. And this is the basis of toxicity where, you know, they believe that administering this in a vaccine is going to result in toxicity due to mercury accumulation, which then will affect the nervous system and then end up in causing autism. So people who consume fish, they are getting, like if, uh, I guess in India, we don't really consume but here they sell them in cans and it's very co commonly consumed by people. So if one dose of a vaccine would contain about 50 uh, micrograms NCGs of ethyl mercury, while one can of tuna has 85 NCGs. So just by eating one can of tuna, you, and this is something that people do repeatedly, right? They're not going to eat fish like once in a lifetime, but like a baby might just get a shot for a specific virus once in their lifetime when they're about three months old. So you can imagine how much more mercury is going to accumulate within the human system by consuming this specific fish than it would if they actually got vaccinated as they should be getting vaccinated. But unfortunately, we don't consider fish, I mean, it's not viewed in the same uh, light as we do, you know, uh, medical intervention. And let's look at aluminium. So aluminium is like, like I said, it's a, it's an adjuvant that is often added into the vaccines, algal. I mean, we call it aluminium hydroxide. So if somebody consumes antacids, which we normally do as soon as we feel some burning in our stomach, it's very, you know, it's a usual, I mean, not an extraordinary thing. And if you look at it, there is about a thousand milligrams of an, aluminum hydroxide in antacid tablets and vaccines have four compared to you know your antacid preparations but again we don't hesitate we just go to the store buy an antacid and take it but when it comes to vaccines there is a lot of hesitancy at least in the human world and again the stuff they feed to babies breast milk formula soy milk um, and then all of these when you add them up the babies are getting about 272 milligrams a day. But again, this is not something that we even think about because it's something that is consumed orally as opposed to, you know, being loaded onto a syringe and then pumped into the body. So let's look at formaldehyde. So formaldehyde, yes, in large doses, it can be cancerous. It's been shown very clearly that it can be. Um, and if it's inhaled, it can cause lung damage. But all of us, from the foods that we consume, we have about 1100 mcg per mil of formaldehyde running through our bloodstream normally, and it doesn't do anything to us. So, and pears, they actually contain a lot of formaldehyde. So one pear would contain about 60,000 micrograms, while vaccines contain about 100 micrograms. So really the amount of formaldehyde that is there in the vaccine, I'm not saying it's not there at all, that it's completely, you know, devoid of any substance that can become a toxin. But when somebody gets a vaccine, they are being exposed to very, very low amounts of these toxic substances. And at those levels, the body can very easily handle, uh, you know, these toxic substances and clear them from the system. So, then going on to the blood clot story. So <clears throat> what is actually happening here? So how do these viral vectors work? 
right? We need to have an understanding of how they work before we can actually figure out if the blood clot issue is real or not. So like I was explaining, what happens here is, let's say this is COVID-19, and then you have these green structures, the spikes that are on the surface, and this is the protective antigen that we want to target in the vaccine, right? We want to deliver this into the system in such a way that it's going to produce antibody and cell-mediated immunity in the vaccinated person. So then this, <clears throat> the gene for this spike protein is taken and it's cloned into this adenoviral vector system. So in such a way that now the adenovirus is going to produce huge amounts of the COVID-19 spike protein. And this whole thing, the adenovirus, along with the COVID-19 spike proteins that it's going to produce is delivered as the vaccine to the host. So once it's within the host, the adenovirus is going to replicate. And then as it replicates, it's going to produce the COVID-19 spike protein antigen. And the host is going to make an antibody or anti and cell-mediated immune response. Truly speaking, both against the adenovirus as well as uh, the SARS-CoV spike protein. So there are several advantages to the system. Uh, it's easy to, you know, make a recombinant vaccine. You can grow adenoviruses to really high titers. It can generate a really strong Im immune response if the system works well and you know the virus doesn't get cleared up. And it sometimes may require low temperatures, but by and large, it's like pretty stable. And all of these, the, there are several adenoviral vector vaccines that are available. And uh, of course, the AstraZeneca, we also have one for Ebola and uh, Johnson & Johnson. And these two are products that are used in Africa. So they are all adenoviral vector vaccines. So then um, how does this vaccine cause blood clots? So is it true that it can cause blood clots even, right? So the technical name for this is vaccine-induced thrombotic immune thrombocytopenia. So if you have finished your um, the physiology lecture on how blood clotting happens, you will know that thrombocytes, your platelets are extremely important in the blood clotting process, right? And this phenomenon was first, I think, um, more commonly recorded for heparin because heparin is often like, uh, it gets administered through different systems when like, for example, during blood transfusion. And this is where they were encountering this problem uh, in patients because heparin uh, for some reason is able to interact with these platelets and then cause damage to the platelets and release this protein called platelet factor four. So the damaged platelets, they release protein, sorry, platelet factor four, which then goes in and forms a complex with heparin. And once again, this is an antigen, which the system at this point starts recognizing as a foreign antigen, right? Because a platelet is a self antigen. So generally the body will not make an immune response to itself. That is the reason we are all alive, right? If we started making antibodies against our own proteins, we would all end up having autoimmune diseases and platelets are a part of our own system. But unfortunately, when it comes in contact with heparin and this PF4 is released, it becomes recognized as a foreign protein in the system and then triggers an IgG response from the B cells. So they start producing huge amounts of antibodies. It's a very potent uh, antigen. And this antibody complex, it, uh, so there are multiple ways in which the pathology can happen. So it starts forming this antigen antibody complexes, which truly in a healthy individual is not a big problem. We make what are called immune complexes all the time. This is how uh, antigens that you know, have completed their function, proteins that have to be removed from the system, they form a complex with the antibody, which then gets cleared up from the system. And usually our body is very efficient at doing this. But in some cases where we get, um, you know, these antigen antibody complexes being formed to such a level that the body is not able to handle it, 
we then end up with having autoimmune diseases. So then uh, the FC portion of this complex is also exposed and many immune cells have what are called FC receptors. They're not just receptors to the antibodies, but you also have this bottom portion of the antibody, which is called the FC portion. It can bind to these platelets, activate them, and then the platelets degranulate, sets up an inflammatory response. And then once the platelet is undergoing this, uh, you know, dysregulation, it can also end up in forming aggregates and then it can cause a small thrombus and these uh, thrombi can basically go in and block small blood vessels or sometimes big blood vessels very very rarely and this is what ends up forming the blood clot and then pedicle hemorrhages or if it's going to be a huge embolus it can result in sudden death and uh, so they have seen that it happens with heparin and in very rare cases now they have seen that it can happen with the AstraZeneca vaccine. So unfortunately there have been about I think 15 cases I think uh, I mean the numbers vary from country to country but overall if you have um, I mean let's say this slide is the latest data and this was uh, actually from BBC. So let's say 11 people in 1 million people which is 100,000 people or I think one lakh people who are at the 25 year old age can get this problem uh, and in 55 year olds I think it's slightly less and they are saying that this is right now this is not true that there is no difference between women or between age because it can truly happen to anybody um, because it's that's what they found with heparin and they just think it's we just haven't heard about enough cases here but if you compare it with people dying with coronavirus, 23 people in a million can actually die with coronavirus at the 25 year old age. And 55 year olds, it can be 55 or more, it's 800 million. So it's always a risk benefit with drugs, any drug that you take or any vaccine. So truly, do we want to contract the disease and then suffer through it with a possibility that there's a much higher mortality rate or would we rather get vaccinated because the chance that the individual is going to be that one person in a million who's going to have this reaction is so low right and if you look at the possibility of somebody dying in a car accident this is for the US I don't even know what it is in India because even within my family I think we have lost three people to accidents so you can see on a national average you would be safer, you know, I mean, you would be more at risk if you just got on a bike and went on a NASA line, right? So that is truly uh, the risk benefit ratio here that we are looking at. And I, I mean, it's almost like being, the chance of being hit by lightning is about the chance that you have of contracting this specific side effect with the vaccine. So I'm not saying it doesn't exist, it does exist. But it's always, you know, a risk benefit ratio that we are looking at. And again, if you look here, this is people where, okay, so all of these are accidents. These are things that we cannot control. And uh, I think in India, this is not as much as a problem. But in the US, we have this huge, huge problem of drug abuse where people are poisoning themselves with opioid drugs, um, even painkillers. And if you look at the figures for the number of people who are addicted to drugs and who die because of overdosing, we get about 12 people in a million, which is close to, you know, it's a really high rate for uh, the number of people who are dying of overdose, which can easily be prevented by them not choosing to have this lifestyle. So really, um, I don't know if we should, you know, be worried about vaccines killing people because of side effects. And again, I don't know whether India has this, but in the US we have this website where it's called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting Site, where people, if they have adverse reactions, can actually go in and report the case, which will trigger an investigation. 
and then uh, if they find that there is a problem a true problem the person will be compensated for uh, you know whatever losses they might have suffered and from this website the number of cases is again roughly about 1 in 100000 and these are very very low and very mild cases of side effects there have not been many cases where serious uh, problems have been encountered and people have been compensated for them so the second myth is that genetic vaccines can integrate into the host dna and then basically go in from there and reprogram the host transcription and translational mechanism and then end up causing various types of problems to the host so can this actually happen right so let's look at the mrna vaccines how does this happen i mean how do these vaccines work so like i was saying for the sars cov pro- virus at least we know that the spike protein is the most protective protein and this is the one that is used in the mrna vaccine so basically they take the coding sequence of the spike protein and then synthesize the mrna and this mrna is directly admin- administered to the host so once it's within the host goes into the system start producing the spike protein and then uh you know the host makes an immune response so again mrna is also found within our own systems as mammalian uh you know host we do make mrna um so truly i mean there could be a possibility that it can get integrated and if we had a live discussion i would have sent you into groups and ha- have you discuss why this can or cannot happen but since we don't have an interactive uh, panel here uh the reason why this cannot happen is that we cannot convert mrna to dna animals cannot do it either because we don't have the enzymes in our body to convert mrna to dna right the central dogma is that we are going from dna to rna to protein so to go back from rna to dna we need this enzyme called reverse transcriptase and only certain viruses um you know especially retroviruses that belong to the class 7 of the baltimore system they are the only ones as well as the you know the hepatitis uh, b virus they are the only ones that can convert rna to dna so by and large we don't have the systems in our body to do this but we do have retroviral dna integrated into our own host dna okay so there is a very very remote possibility that this can happen unless you know the dna that's in our system is making reverse transcriptase but uh, you know i don't think this will in reality that it's a very small possibility but dna vaccines on the other hand is directly injecting plasmid dna into the host and this is uh, you know since it is double stranded dna that resembles our own dna there is a high i mean not a high possibility but the possibility that it can integrate into the host is much larger than it is for rna vaccines and this is the reason why this technology actually never took off so there are hardly any commercial vaccines for uh, dna i mean dna vaccines there is one for west nile that we use in the united states here and dna vaccines by and large have uh, had very strict regulatory uh, constraints so they have never actually been released into the market for commercial use in a large scale and that being said the third myth is the vaccines can actually cause the disease that they should prevent so is this a possibility can it happen so um to do this we i mean to see if this can happen we have to understand how the viral life cycle actually works you might have already had this in your classes but the first thing that happens is that the virus would attach to a cell once it's inside a cell it would uncoat release its genetic material once the genetic material is released you have your host dna polymerases rna polymerases they make copies of the viral genetic material which then gets translated into viral proteins and then everything assembles and then the virus can either exit the system or stay within the cell and spread from cell to cell right 
So for all of this to happen, there are two things that have to happen. Okay, there have to be systems to replicate the viral genetic material, and there has to be a system to genetic to replicate the viral proteins. And both of these systems have to come together for a virus to complete its life cycle and to be productive within a host. But if you look at vaccines, inactivated vaccines are completely killed. There is no way they can go back and replicate within the host system again. Attenuated vaccines, yes, this is a problem because it can potentially revert to virulence. And this is why they undergo extensive testing they have to be passaged multiple times in animals before they can, we know that they will not revert and become a virulent virus again before they can be administered into the host system. And uh, nucleic acids, they are just DNA or RNA. So, and that too, not the complete DNA or RNA of the virus. So there is no way they can go back and become a complete viral particle again, right? But. I mean, there have been instances in the history of vaccines where this has happened before. And this was way back before the technology is as developed as it is right now. Because in 1955, children who were administered the polio vaccine, unfortunately, it was not completely inactivated. So they ended up getting polio. Um, and uh, this was the Qatar vaccine story, which was, you know, the horror story that has started all of these stories, I mean, that are associated with uh, the fears that vaccines can cause disease. And uh, among the COVID-19 vaccines, the Bharat Biotech Covaxin is an inactivated vaccine. So there is a potential, but I'm very, very sure that, you know, the government of India would not have released this vaccine if this was going to be a problem. And in 1960, uh, again, SV40 was discovered, and this is an oncogenic virus. And this was uh, actually kind of again found to contaminate some batches of polio vaccine. But I don't think there have been instances of people developing cancers because of SV40. It's not a human virus. So the myth number four is that vaccines can cause autism and autoimmune disorders. And again, linked to this, too many vaccines administered too soon can cause disorders as well. And I know this is not relevant to veterinary medicine. I would not have uh, brought this up, except that I want to demonstrate that this is one of the most horrific stories of where misinformation, lack of logical thinking has caused so much damage, where people have believed that vaccines can cause autism because of popular opinion. It's just not based on science. and. At least here in the U.S., a lot of uh, you know young mothers have stopped vaccinating their children, and we are seeing uh, you know increases in diseases like measles, mumps. These were diseases that are very easily controlled by vaccination, but unfortunately are coming back. So this kind of this uh, is the face of the two people who are uh, you know uh, right now the faces of the anti-vaccine movement here. Jennifer McCarthy and uh, this guy, Andrew Wakefield. So her logic is, my son got vaccinated, something changed in him, he became autistic. My son is my science. So this is what she says, and she's a, you know, a celebrity. So she carries a lot of weight. And uh, Andrew Wakefield, I'm sure you heard of the story where he had just eight subjects from a study who children who were given the MMR vaccine, and soon afterwards they became autistic. So the he created an association between MMR and autism, and this story has stuck for decades and decades. So we as, you know, as human beings, as people who think logically, we are hardwired to make associations, right? So if we look at a snake, we assume it's going to be poisonous. We have to do this because it's the flight or fight uh, system within our bodies to help us preserve our own selves. But we also know that there are snakes which are not poisonous. So when it rains, we know that people carry umbrellas, but we also have the ability to say, if people are carrying umbrellas, it, it doesn't mean that it's going to rain, right? 
So this again, some things though are common sense. You know that if you keep eating and eating and eating, we are going to end up with a weight problem, right? So that is common sense. But like I said, people can carry umbrellas when it rains, but just because people are, if not, they're not carrying umbrellas, it doesn't mean it cannot rain or the vice versa, right? So this is a logical fallacy that we many times, all of us fall prey to this. It's like if it's A, then B, but if it's not B, then it's not A, right? And this is unfortunately what is happening with vaccines at this point in time. So for example, look at this figure where we have, you know, like the number of autism cases between 97 and 2012. We have seen a rise in a pretty much like one in 88 children are diagnosed with autism in the US. So during this period, the number of shots also went up. Now children are in a lifetime before their 18 years, get between 23 to 25 shots in their uh, first 18 years of life. So does this mean that the vaccines are causing the autism? So let's look at this example. So here is autism in uh, purple. So again, like I said, 1997, 2009, cases of autism went up dramatically. But then if you look at uh, the sales of organic food, right? It also went up at the same time. So does it mean that organic food sales is causing autism? Why should we then think that vaccines are causing autism, right? So let's look at this one here. This is actually from the CDC website. So if you again look at the number of um, people who drowned in swimming pools between 1999 and 2009, it's this red line here. So you can see the trend line here. And then this is the number of movies that Nicolas Cage released during that same period of time in black. And you can see that the number of Nicolas Cage movies are kind of following the same trend. So does it mean that people are watching this actor's movies and they're deciding to go in and drown themselves? It makes no sense, right? So, um, so the bottom line is when we look at data like this, we should remember that correlation does not mean causation. So there are a whole lot of different epidemiology scientific tools that we have to use before we can say that vaccines are causing autism or they are not causing autism. So these would be case control studies where we would have a group of people who are not vaccinated and then they are followed for, I don't know, 20, 30 years of their life. And then you have a group of people who are vaccinated, follow them over a period of time. And then if the vaccinated people are getting more autism than the unvaccinated people, then you can probably make a causation, right? But just drawing, um, you know, making a correlation and assuming that correlation is causation is a very common scientific flaw. Unfortunately, it has affected, uh, you know, vaccine uptake uh, quite a bit. So I think I'm out of time and I can, I guess I'm stopping here. So I just wanted to share a few pictures of my lab members. And this is Tarikul who actually helped me uh, research this topic and put this uh, PowerPoint together. He's my new PhD student. And we only have a few minutes. I'm glad to take any questions if you have them. So no burning questions? No. <laughs> so I, what have, are you I, have, I have a question. No, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Krupp. No, because in the last uh, few slides, you were mentioning about, uh, you know, this uh, autism and uh, uh, vaccination. And then you also concluded saying that, uh, you know, correlation is not uh, uh, causation. Uh, but, you know, but my question is, what prompted people to uh, correlate uh, vaccination with autism. Uh, were there any, you know, like, uh, so there would have, certainly there would have been issues that would have made, because, you know, we don't correlate uh, uh, apples and pears, and, you know, we don't compare apples and uh, pears. So, what was the, 
what made people to correlate the autism and uh, rats in general? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I uh, I just briefly had a picture of Andrew Wakefield, who is the scientist who first published a study in the Lancet, where he uh, was a physician and he had um, examined eight children who received the MMR vaccine. And shortly after they received the MMR vaccine, they became autistic. And this was the basis on which he wrote this paper in Lancet. For some reason, it went through peer review. And then uh, I think the press got involved and it got a lot of publicity. So truly, the science that was conducted by him was not valid science because he just drew conclusions based on this small number of uh, you know, cases. And he did not have a control group where the children were not vaccinated and he followed them and he showed whether or not they also had autism or not. So the whole design was flawed and later on, I think this uh, manuscript was withdrawn and he was also, I think, penalized for, uh, you know, publishing this data. But unfortunately, he has stuck with the story and he has partnered with celebrities who also, like I mentioned, have had personal instances where their children developed autism. So unfortunately, the science behind this is not solid. And subsequently, several really, really good scientific um, publications have been released where thousands of people were studied to determine whether vaccines caused autism or not uh, using many different epidemiological models. But unfortunately, until today, people still do believe that, yeah. So I'm sorry, did I, uh, did I answer? Yeah, yeah, you, you answered my question. There is yeah. also another question in the chat box uh, where Aniruddha Suri has uh, raised a question. He <laughs> says your opinion on uh, Algel IMDG adjuvant used in Covaxin. What is your yes. opinion on that adjuvant? So, uh, like I said, Algel, it has been used for a very long time in several vaccines. It's not a new uh, adjuvant that you know we are having in the COVID system. So very likely, if you have taken vaccines before, you already have been exposed to this specific adjuvant. Um, and I know that there are other adjuvants that are used in the RNA vaccines, which are oil-based. And these adjuvants actually have a more potent uh, cytokine response, which is why you know we end up getting a uh, I would say fever and body aches right after we receive these vaccines. Um, but I'm not sure if there are other ingredients in Covishield or Covaxin that are causing these reactions because I know that the COVID vaccines seem to have a lot more reactivity than other vaccines that we have been used to uh, taking before. But uh, by and large, I, uh, I mean, the aluminum hydroxide based adjuvants are not a concern. Question. Sure. Uh, see, now uh, almost uh, the one third of the population in the world is getting vaccinated. Do you think that uh, we need to continue this uh, vaccine against Corona on an annual basis? Or, uh, because this is very present, we, we cannot uh, presume whether we but what do you, what's your opinion on that? <coughs> So I think this is kind of one instance where veterinary medicine can inform what is happening in human health. <coughs> um, at least to my knowledge, I work with swine viruses. And I think in the last 10 years, we have had about four new swine viruses crop up. Sometimes within two years of each other, we have had, <coughs> we have had uh, PDV and then we have had uh, Delta Corona. And so the thing is, there are vaccines for these viruses and they have been in Asia for a very long time. So they have tried inactivated vaccines, they have tried attenuated vaccines. Unfortunately, they are not <coughs> highly effective. So what has happened is that the population gets either exposed or vaccinated, but then after a period of time, these coronaviruses become endemic. So at least in veterinary medicine, this is the lesson that we have learned about coronaviruses. I mean, granted that human research, there's a lot more money, it's a lot more sophisticated. 
So if they can come up with technology that can stop the virus in its tracks, which I highly doubt, because even the preliminary uh, information is showing that there are breakthroughs. The viruses are evolving as quickly as we are able to produce vaccines. So what is likely to happen is that the severity of infection may not be as much because as the population gets exposed either through vaccination or infection, we are going to develop some level of immunity. So even as the virus is evolving, it, unless it acquires mutations that actually the SARS-CoV-1 had a 50% mortality rate. So we are really, really lucky that this one doesn't have that, but it's a possibility it can happen. And it would be very, very unfortunate if that happened. But because of vaccines and prior infection, we may not get the disease as, uh, it may not be as severe a disease, but I personally think it is going to become endemic that we are going to end up having to vaccinate every year and, you know, do the same thing that we are doing with the flu. But so, in, in continuous of that, uh, I don't know, this is a very preliminary data. The second wave of uh, in India, the positivity rate is, is quite high than the first wave. Uh, in many South Indian states, even in like Kerala and Tamil Nadu, the positivity rate is almost close to 20%. I think the first wave, we didn't have uh, positivity rate, I think more than around 10 12%. Uh, maybe I should get mutated would be the reason, but do you think any other uh, reason for this? High positive Well, uh, at least from the news reports that I'm watching, it looks like there was a lot of uh, relaxation of the social distancing and masking and people became too complacent. And I think they started going back to like a normal oh. life. Yeah. And uh, you had the Kumbh Mela and then there was the election rallies. Uh, you know, that is at least what I'm gathering from the news where huge numbers of people have had a possibility of getting exposed. And of course the variants, if they acquire mutations that are, I mean, that remains to be seen. But uh, those two, I think, would be the biggest factors for why, you know, it's the second wave. It's very unfortunate. Without time, we can take a few more questions also. Oh yeah, right. sure. I'm I'm around. I'm sorry. I kind of thought it won't be interactive, so I timed it so there was only five minutes left. Um, so you know, if there are, I mean, I have I have a couple of uh, questions to ask. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. So number one, you know, it's kind of comparison of uh, veterinary science and uh, human uh, science. You know, in, uh, in in veterinary in veterinary science, uh, particularly in avian uh, virology, they give a lot of importance to local immune response. Uh, so we we always say that the local response should be very good to prevent the virus spreading from the site of uh, entry. So that's the reason for Newcastle disease. We prime the body first to ensure good local response at the uh, site of uh, but you know, predominantly this issue is not discussed with the uh, with coronavirus uh, thing. Um, you know, um, uh, there was an attempt to develop a spray vaccine also, but I'm I'm, not, I'm really not sure where the uh, progress of work stands at uh, this point of uh, time. Um, because you know, we give lot of importance to local Indian as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this particular uh, virus uh, is basically a respiratory virus only. You know? it just affects. It doesn't go Absolutely. beyond uh, beyond that. But there is no systemic uh, spread by uh, So you do you think that local immune response plays a major role in? Yeah, like, I mean, in, uh, I, yeah. Absolutely. I I'm not sure why they already have not gone in that direction. I think it was partly because one thing they are using nucleic acid vaccines, which are already a new field. And uh, I guess intranasally delivering mRNA or DNA, uh, I think the concern would be whether their uptake as well as 
the way the antigen is processed kind of would be the same because we know how the system works when it's delivered into muscle cells. But I mean, I totally agree with you that it would make sense to produce more mucosal associated immune responses in the respiratory tract is what we should be targeting for effective COVID protection. Uh, but I think as we start getting more platforms into commercial use, uh, it, it's probably likely that they will try the intranasal route. And I think the reason they may not have done it is because of the mRNA and uh, the, you know, the adenoviral platforms that they are using. Uh, I'm not sure if there are, I mean, are you aware of adenoviral vector vaccines that can be delivered int intranasally? I mean, so uh, that might be, you know, the reason they are not doing it. But I mean, we already know that influenza vaccines for sure work better when they are delivered intranasally. Yeah. So it's only a matter of time. Uh, another another question, second question, um, you know, uh, probably, you know, the, the mutations that happens in viruses, you know, uh, the media, it gives a lot of importance to you know, the word uh, mutation. Because generally, you know, uh, the common man thinks that mutation makes a dog, a cat, or a cow, a <laughs> horse, you know, that's what people normally, yeah. normally think. Right, right. But we, 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 we a different uh, view. Now, if you see the scenario, it is a RNA virus. And you know, there's nothing called RNA replication in a cell. So obviously, the cell is not having any enzyme to support RNA replication. You also mentioned in your picture, from, from one RNA molecule, another RNA molecule cannot be produced, or from RNA, DNA cannot be produced, because we lack enzyme RNA different RNA polymerase. And because, uh, so RNA viruses are more prone for the mutations. So every replication could lead to uh, point mutation. But most of the point mutations are silent mutation because of redundancy of the code or for the wobble or for the wobble. So it, it just goes uh, unnoticed. And sometimes these mutations can also lead to a missense mutation where some other amino acid can be produced. The whole thing can be changed. changed. Right, right. Even if it is changed, depending on the hydrophilicity and phobicity, the epitopes are going to, the epitopes may not uh, change. Match. So finding of antigen antibody, we all know it's a shape mediated uh, a shape mediated uh, reaction. Yeah. <coughs> and again if it is a nonsense medium, it is beneficial to the society. Only. Suddenly the virus will disappear from the uh, yeah. So are we focusing mutation mostly on the wrong side? Um, you know, because we know that there are plenty of mutations happening. Unless the mutation changes the immunogenicity, one need not uh, bother about it. I Worry, yeah. Worry about it, I guess. So, no, yeah. No. So, uh... No, this is completely true and, uh, you know, if this, like, if what you mentioned could happen and if it acquired a deleterious mutation that's going to wipe it out of the population, that is the best thing that can happen. But, you know, the reality is once it's at this stage, for that to happen, it's been, it's very, very rare. Like, I mean, with the, the SARS-CoV-1, it did suddenly disappear from the system. Um, we don't know exactly why it did that, but you know, it's a possibility that it can happen, but now with the amount of uh, SARS-CoV-2 that's out there, uh, you know, it's highly unlikely that. But uh, unfortunately, especially for coronaviruses, the receptor binding site is highly, I think it's conserved and it's just that small, uh, I guess, 10 to 15 amino acid segment. So regardless of, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is if the mutations happen within that specific sequence, it can have deleterious consequences for vaccines because that is what is being coded for. And once that specific and the antigenicity of that receptor binding site changes, and it has changed in two of the mutants at least, the South African as well as the Brazilian uh, viruses have mutations in that specific receptor binding site. And that is the reason we are concerned that there can be vaccine escape. 
but yeah but if the mutations were to happen in the other regions of the virus of course it can influence pathogenicity either it can knock down the virulence or it can increase virulence so those could be the other consequences of so i mean i would not completely dismiss uh, the consequences of these mutations for vaccine mediated protection um, largely because like for example uh, the bharat biotech is an inactivated vaccine so it's not just the receptor binding site it has all the viral proteins in the yeah so it's more likely to have a basis for cell mediated immunity when the next variant crops up but on the other hand moderna or pfizer they only have that spike protein so if the spike you know accumulation of mutations happens in the spike it is going to affect vaccine mediated immunity down the line now uh, probably one last clarification on this so even if point mutation happens in the antigen binding cells but still it could be a silent mutation because of redundancy of it. oh yeah absolutely even if point yeah. the same amino acid will be produced right right and oh, then even the new amino acid if it is not going to vary in hydrophobicity it's not going to change that <coughs> yeah no that is true i and i mean those kind those kind of mutations would not be a concern so the problem is just these mutations really leading to a change in antigen catastrophic change is uh, you know probably we have to do a real estimate and do um well yeah so i guess it would again boil down to the same principle of antigenic shift and antigenic drift which we already know is happening in influenza viruses so in influenza viruses the concept that drift is point mutations it's not that there is a dramatic change no, or a shift in, but even those shifts can make quite a bit of difference to the receptor binding between the b cell and t cell as well as the antigen and it's the affinity and the affinity of the antigen that determines the subsequent strength of the immune response so even having those minor changes for viruses can have downstream effects in the strength of the immune response that is stimulated well one last point corona being a non segment how do that such kind of shift is not going to uh, yeah the shift not, yeah not going right to. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of questions for you in the chat box. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> the first question is from uh, BVN 19063. He says, "Hello, ma'am. Is there any evidence a person who is getting vaccinated against COVID-19 um, will not get the disease after exposure to the virus?" Yeah. So that's a great question. Yeah. I think all, all of us are. like waiting for that answer at this point at least the sci- scientists in the field because we know what the companies are claiming right we know that they are claiming 98% they are claiming 92% and so on and so forth but yeah. the proof of the pudding is in the eating so we will get that data you know i think in a few months and the cdc a couple of weeks ago released some preliminary data and they have found about 5000 um, vaccine escape breakthrough cases from i believe 17 or 18 million people who were vaccinated so it's not a huge yeah it's a small number but small nevertheless the, yeah then i have had a data okay and i don't know what the indian data is that almost similar to that something like uh, 100 million doses of covid uh, shield they had i think few thousands uh, uh, of yeah there is the covaxin is some uh, 70 million or it's again it's about some 10 right. 60 million right so right now they are, the number seems small but even in my own personal uh, circle of friends i know at least three people who have got the vaccine and who have got the disease so uh, you know again cdc cdc and you know fda is fda and icmr is icmr so they might tell us things that we should be hearing or we might not i'm a skeptic um you know i'm not saying that don't trust them or don't get vaccinated but the reality is it's a lot more complex and i think what is happening now it has never happened in the history of a vaccine is that that phase 2 is being conducted in real time in human body it has never happened before so yeah and another question uh, you know the uh, from atulpi suresh he says uh, Bharat by I mean will the nasal vaccine a game changer uh, Bharat Biotech is in phase 3 trial 
Well, that is uh, really good news. Well, uh, it all depends on how the vaccine pans out. Uh, you know, if having, like we said, it's definitely desirable to have the mucosal immunity, respiratory mucosal immunity, compared to, you know, what they're doing right now, delivering the vaccine in a systemic way and trying to stimulate systemic immunity. Like rationally, it makes sense. But uh, again, we have to wait and see uh, what the vaccine efficacy data is going to be like. But the word of caution is, uh, you know, mucosal immune response, there is no memory. No, you know, every time you got to consider as a primary response. So to what extent, you know, it, it's not like a systemic immune response. Where, you know, you got memory cells and other uh, things coming up. So, well, because of, yeah. Sorry, there's a lot of disturbance. Uh, no, I agree. I'll, I'll, I'll just mute spam. Uh, yeah, you oh, know, yeah. there's a that issue so of memory much. has to be studied in detail before predicting the success of mucosal. Uh, well, that is uh, true as well, because I think the model that we have is again influenza and people get vaccinated every year. Every year so, they get annual vaccination. Yeah. Seasonal right, annual right. vaccination. Right. Right. Samuel has got a question. He'll ask Samuel. Uh-huh. Samuel, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, there's one question for me that is, uh, can this, uh, we, we, we are talking about herd immunity, we for vaccinating everybody. Can this vaccine pressure lead to mutation of this virus? So that's a great question, Sam. Actually, I am really, really interested in studying how vaccines can actually <clears throat> drive viral evolution in the field. Because it's one thing when you have an experimental model and then you put some animals in a room, you vaccinate them and come up with what the vaccine efficacy is, right? In real life, it doesn't work like that. So by and large, if you're vaccinating, um, you know, an animal that's in a herd, it's not just going to have that one disease that you're trying to target. It's usually the animal will have multiple diseases going on in the system at the same time. And all of this is going to affect how the animal is going to react against the vaccine. And uh, historically, we already know that canine parvo is a classic example where, you know, uh, we started with one strain of canine parvo and uh, dogs get vaccinated very systematically, very regularly. And the virus has changed over time. So this, I mean, it's one uh, classic example of how a vaccine has actually caused the virus to evolve and uh, mutate. The fortunate thing is it has not impacted uh, protection to a level that the clinical disease is getting manifested. But nevertheless, um, there are some viruses, viruses that are more prone to mutation, especially with coronaviruses. And that was my concern when they released vaccines that had about 50 or 60 percent efficacy, because that is a surefire way of driving viral evolution in the field when you're giving suboptimal uh, levels of protection to the population, it's definitely like a ground where the virus can thrive and mutate and then make use of selective pressure to its own advantage. So, again, I mean, it's a matter of concern, but at the moment, this is all we have, right? It's a question of weighing the risk against the benefit. So it definitely is something that we have to watch out for. Uh, 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 yeah, we can say these virus and bacteria are uh, smart living things. It's only a matter of time. The uh, ball to decide ball is in which part of the food. <laughs> well, who would have thought that this small virus can, you know, bring the world to a standstill and do this? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think many people have the privilege of living through a pandemic like we are living through it right now. Yeah. Uh, 
I thank Dr. Sheila for the excellent uh, lecture. Uh, given it was really a good lecture, good data. And, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your for uh, delivering this lecture. So we will keep in touch with you, you know, because we Absolutely. are because because of the pandemic situation, we are trying to arrange a lot of uh, informative uh, guest lectures, and uh, we I'm sure we will. We need your help in. in oh, absolutely! It, it's a total pleasure. I just wish it was, you know, we could have been in person, and that's the situations were better. But it's truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank uh -huh. you. Good bye, day. Sam. Good bye, day. Shankaran. Good day. Bye.